Hello, everyone, and welcome to Budgetary Budgeting Secrets for Cinematographers. And I want to thank you all uh, for being a part of this. I know during this whole COVID-19 thing, I hope it finds all of you safe uh, and, and healthy. And uh, I'm here for inspiration. Uh, I'm staying very positive through all these times. Lydia and I have uh, been keeping into the, the mental mindset of, of meditation and we've been uh, working out. I've lost 34 pounds. Can you believe that? Look at the, the trimness in my face now. <laughs> so, uh, okay, this is going to be really awesome. Now, we have a super chat window that we have set up. So, uh, if you want to... Um, to put your question in there, uh, all proceeds go to feedingamerica.org. Uh, I've seen these countless lines of food banks and cars and everyone uh, coming in, and we want to kind of do our part uh, to, uh, to help feed uh, all of Americans through this time. Okay, let's get this party started. I am going to do my best in this tech wizardry of uh, YouTube. Uh, I'm going to my screen and now I'm gonna go for it. All right, so this is Budgeting Secrets for Cinematographers. And right off the bat, we're gonna start with Fathers and Daughters. Now this movie was a $16 million budget. And just like anything, uh, when you get in there, you're going to have to work within these parameters. And I wanted to start with a story because this one was something that really kind of took my... Because every time you do a movie or a commercial, you're obviously learning from these experiences, right? And I try to learn as much as I can from each film I do. And so the next one is even better. Uh, and on this one, we had a 30-day uh, schedule. We were on five-day weeks. We had two weeks on stage, which was Russell Crowe's uh, New York uh, apartment. And we have five weeks on location. And this was kind of very unique because we had Amanda Seyfried and uh, Aaron Paul for the first three weeks of uh, the movie and three and a half weeks. And then uh, we switched over to Russell Crowe and uh, the little uh, Kylie Rogers, who was doing uh, the, the Amanda Seyfried as a young, you know, Katie as a this young girl. So we had a, a really unique schedule. Now, just so uh, no one really talks about this, uh, I, I, as much as I have done all these feature films, each one is a little different, but a good way to go about it is 1% of your film's budget is your lighting and grip budget. So, Fathers and Daughters was $16 million, so that means I have $160,000 for lights, grips, cranes, condors, scissor lifts, manpower, trucks, and generators. Okay, now, Sometimes they slide it to 1.2%, 1.25, 1.5%, but most of the time it is a uh, 1%. Now let's break it down in regards to the conversations that you have with the director uh, and about budget and about how they want it all to roll out. So on this film, uh, Gabriel Muccino uh, wanted every location to be pre-rigged. And the reason he wanted that is because he wanted to have the most amount of time with the actors to work through their performances to get the best out of that situation. And that's our job as cinematographers to be able to do that because the performance is everything. And then the icing on the cake is how we take the lighting and we take the camera and we take their uh, performances higher. So that's the icing on the cake. But the cake itself is the director getting in there and having the time 
to be able to absolutely get the best performances. The director, Gabrielli, wanted to use three cameras all the time. Okay, this was something that was never discussed till day one. And then once he saw the way uh, the actors were working, he said, oh my God, this is going to be so amazing if we can do it with three cameras all the time. So that was a big curveball that I had to immediately adjust to. Gabrielli also wanted to rehearse on stage with the lighting set up. So we wanted to uh, go when we weren't necessarily shooting. So we would come in uh, after we wrapped and he wanted to be able to rehearse with Russell Crowe and Kylie and Amanda Seyfried on the existing sets with the lights on. And this was a request that a lot of times directors love this. They want to see the element. They want to see where it's at. They want to see what the mood of this of the room is going to look like. So I wanted to be able to do that for him. And then the director also wanted every shot rehearsed and blocked perfectly before any actors came on set. So this required our stand-ins to be very close to what Russell Crowe and Kylie Rogers look like. Uh, they also had to, had to learn all their lines so they, we could rehearse all the timings. Uh, and this was a very active camera movement. Uh, sorry, <laughs> very active camera movie, movie. So the camera was moving from two, three, four different rooms, going underneath beds, doing all that stuff. So these were things that we rehearsed with all the stand-ins tracking their lines. They would all watch when Russell Crowe and, and Kylie Rogers came in and rehearsed a scene. They would watch it. They would see the uh, how they were doing the lines and then they would duplicate them. They would all go back to hair and makeup. We would rehearse these moves totally and then we'd come out. Okay, so now that I've told you what Gabriele wants, I want to then look at work with the producer to say, okay, what do we got? So the producer had no rigging team budgeted, okay? He had 13 and a half hours budgeted, and that was going to be for possible, uh, you know, us just taking the time to move into the locations, to cable them all up, to do all that stuff. There was no budget for my stage package either because I obviously wanted to be able to hang all these lights in there, and so there was no budget for that. There was no C camera team budgeted as well. So I was like, oh, okay, he wants to shoot with three cameras. He wants to have everything pre-rigged. Uh, he wants to be able to go into the stage and have it all lit, but there's no budget for that. Oh, and there's no pre-calls, okay? So I, all of a sudden, had a lot of things that were stacked up against me. So this is where you have to then go back to your director. And you have to say, okay, where are we going to find the money? We understand that you want all these things, and I want to be able to give all of those things to you. But the producer is saying we, we're not able to have all those things. So how can we find the money to do this? So I looked to Gabrielli, and I said, I go, you have such an amazing plan already. You've done all the shot lists for the movie. You know exactly where we're going to be. You've gone to all these locations. You've blocked the scenes in your head. Let's save time and we'll save money. And that was the big aha moment for both of us. We were like, okay, so let's do the money, the budget on this. Let's, let's do this for a second. So if I save, because we have 13 and a half hours budgeted, okay, for my crew. So if I do a 10 hour day, then that is saving three and a half hours of overtime where I have transportation, I have all hair, makeup and wardrobe, I have all my lighting and grip teams. That saved on this movie, $56,000, okay, in one day. So we looked at it and for all the pre-rigging teams, and all the, the extra lighting and everything that we needed on stage, we had to save up to around three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars to be able to pay for all that. So that's exactly what we did. 
We did 10 10 hour days and that gave us $560,000. Then we th tossed in a couple eight hour days and we tossed in two six hour days. And then all of the problems started to be absolutely solved immediately. And it all comes down to a director being completely prepared, knowing exactly what he or she has, and this enabled us to save a lot of money. On safety, we had the same thing I, with the Disney film. I used the same thought process and we saved so much money. We saved over $2 million based on being incredibly prepared and we were able to save time and that saved a ton of money. Now on safety, they were only budgeted for 12 hours. So we had to save even more money that way by saving, uh, by making more 10 hour days throughout the whole mix to afford all the stuff, LED walls and all the stuff that we wanted to do for traveling shots and everything. But it's again, it's prioritizing and having the director, you know, when I first started out, I was like, you know what? I don't want to involve the director in any of this. He's he or she's got too much on their mind and I don't want to include them in that. And what it ended up doing is it fell all on me. And I was this just huge stress magnet because I was taking all that and you don't need to take all that. It's something that needs to be shared just like you share the load, just like the crew completely makes you uh, shine so bright. So you have to share this stress. And that's what I did. I went to Gabrielli. I told them exactly what we had and we set it up for success. All right, we're on to questions. What do we got, Lydia? Yeah, it's the nickel and diming is everything because all these small little things you're going to do are going to have a massive impact overall, right? Uh, it's just like the style of how you're making a movie. Like uh, if you're making a movie that's handheld and then all of a sudden it becomes stable and then it goes back to handheld, it's something you're going to feel over the whole project of the film, not like, oh my God, he's going to handheld. Oh my God, he's now stable. That, that's not, it's a feeling. So it's exactly with the budget. So saving time is something that you're going to immediately just start to see impact. And on fathers and daughters, we were able to save enough, not only just to give me the lighting and grip time, but also gave art department much more time. And they were able to make the sets so much cooler. Like we didn't have budget uh, when uh, Clancy, uh, the production designer, who was unbelievable uh, production designer, he, he didn't have money for like the walls outside of windows to do like textured uh, brick walls in between. And uh, I wanted windows and I wanted to be able to put practicals out there. So there was depth outside the windows on the stage. There was no budget for that. But as we started to save time and money, not only the, the savings that I was doing so Gabriele could have all these pre-rigs, it also infused throughout all of production. So this time, uh, save time, saves money is huge. Because you think about all the OT that it's going to take to move the company as well. If we finish at 13 and a half hours, there's a whole company all the, the, the uh, transportation and the Teamsters have to move the company to the next location. Well, now they're in 14 and 15 hours uh, and it just goes up exponentially. So if you can do it to 10 and then they skate out at 12 hours and they're able to move the company to the next location and we're all ready to go the next day, you see how this ripple, it's a massive ripple effect. Okay, what else we got, Lydia? Yes, 
pretty much. Uh, it's, it's, you know, depending on how much VFX uh, or if there's specialty gags or something, it might go up to 1.5%, but that's usually uh, the, the, the way it works. Um, I, I found that, you know, across the board, if you got a $300,000 spot, then you're looking at you probably got thirty thousand or maybe thirty five forty thousand in lighting and grip. Uh, the camera and everything is another line, and that ends up being uh, you know sometimes like one point one another percent with camera depending on if you're doing three cameras or two cameras. All that uh, is a little different. What else? Jane, they can't hear me, so if you could repeat the question. Um, oh. Gotcha. Yeah. Why does switching to the 10 hour day save money, Carl wants to know? And does that mean that the crew had to work faster than usual to get everything pre rigged? So, why don't you repeat that question? Okay. So, Carl is asking why does switching to, the why does switching to a 10 hour day uh, save you money? Okay. So, most people are on either, either an 8 or a 10 hour day. Uh, based on union protocols. So a 10 hour day is what our rates are usually based on. So, uh, or sometimes they're based on eight. It, it just all depends what is negotiated. But with that, so if you had 13 and a half hours budgeted, which is what our producer had, then that's 13, that's 3.5 hours that is so you go from 10 hours to, 11, to 12 hours is time and a half. And then from 12 hours to 13 and a half hours is going to be double time. So you can see how quickly that adds up with a 70, 80 to 190 person crew, that's going to go up exponentially. So uh, on safety, when we were doing a 10 hour day and I had 70, uh, football players and all of the uh, referees and all the you know football coordinators and all that stuff on and all the hair making wardrobe to be able to dress all of them and everything you see how that stacks up ridiculous like it's it's massive savings on that so and it's not about being uh, working quicker it's just doing the right work in pre-production to shot list it out, to block it out so you know what the blocking is going to be. So it's not like you just hit the ground running in, in regards to, okay, normal set etiquette. If you do not do your homework and do not shot list and do not do your blocking schematics and do not do your lighting schematics, this is what happens. Basically, you show up, you bring the actors in, you watch the scene rehearse, then you get with the script supervisor and the director and you plan out, okay, yeah, we need a close up here, we need a wide shot here, we need an over the shoulder here, we need a this, that, and the other thing. Now you're planning it all out. That takes time, 35 minutes, 45 minutes, then I'm planning that out. I'm not lighting the set because I'm, the, 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 uh, the distraction is now trying to figure out the whole plan where if you come in with blocking schematics and a shot list, you're already lighting to that shot list. I don't have to see the rehearsal. Of course, we are going to do the rehearsal, but I'm already starting, like the lights are already moving in place the minute we walk in at our call time. The, the camera is getting set up to exactly the first shot that we know it is. All that is planned, so you can see how that saves money. Okay. People want to see you, not us. Oh my God, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is ridiculous. They all. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt. But people... I'm so bad at this. I'm so sorry. So yes, you don't want to be looking at a question screen. You they want to be want to looking at me. Okay, good. So that's the whole idea. Saving time is the best way to save money because the most expensive thing on the whole budget is manpower. It's not equipment, it's not location fees, it's not sets, it's not any of that stuff. It's manpower, okay? And it's, it's the personnel. So if you can shorten the hours, 
by being very experienced and doing great pre-production. You know, I do all these blocking schematics so I know exactly where everyone is. I do lighting schematics based on the shot list. So there's nothing like we come in and we look at the scene and we see where the actors go and now I gotta figure out how to light it and now we gotta figure out the shot list. That's how it was done way back when. Those times are over. We don't have the time or the budget to work in those parameters. We have to really come up with a great plan in pre-production in a vacuum, as I call it, so we can then go for this and really make it uh, as, as cost effective and efficient as possible. All right, what do we got, Lydia? All right, one more. How many more questions? <laughs> I'll take one more question. My God, they weren't seeing me, and I was like staring right into the, <laughs> their eyes. It's okay. Okay. We're learning. I know. Um, okay, everybody's loving this. So, John wants to know, how many pre-production days should a DP get? So, that depends, I'm sure, on the project, but do we have... Yeah, so how many uh, pre-production days should a director of photography get? On a normal schedule, like a 20-day, 30-day movie, it's usually around four weeks uh, of, of prep. Uh, going up to a 40-day schedule, you're looking at six weeks. Going up to a 60 to an 80-day schedule, you're looking at anywhere from uh, eight weeks to 10 weeks. On Terminator Salvation, I had 25 weeks of prep on that. Uh, because what we had to do is there was so much pre-visualization where we had to pre-vis all the one-er shots and I'm discussing lenses with the uh, pre-vis artists and working with Mick G and the, the second unit uh, director and everything so we can fine-tune all that. So uh, those, the bigger the, the count and the higher the budget, the more prep days uh, and prep weeks you get. Uh, on fathers and daughters, because we're using that as a case study, I had three weeks. Uh, and I had four weeks of prep, but I was prepping another movie at the same time. So I had three weeks, and then I took off to go to Italy and France and all this, prepping another uh, movie that was doing a pre-scout, and then came back and then shot fathers and daughters. Now... I would have never been able to feel comfortable doing that without the amazing prep of Gabriel Muccino. Uh, just like how he rolls out, the script is the Bible. Now, you say that, well, of course, Shane, the script is the Bible on every movie. No, not on Gabriel Muccino movies. The script becomes the Bible because he embeds in the script the whole shot list on every scene, and I embed what every uh, scene is going to look like, what it's going to feel like, what the camera is going to feel like, what the mood and tone in the room is going to look and feel like, what the shadows, your contrast, is it silhouette -y? is it dark, is it airy? All that is embedded in one document. So it communicates everything to the crew. So immediately the AD is starting to see how many shots we have in the schedule. We're able to schedule this thing perfectly. You see this on safety, because we did all this prep and all this, there was a 50 day schedule and we were able to cut it to 45 days. So I cut five days out of the budget just by doing my homework and all of us doing our homework and all of us embedding it and communicating the vision to all departments so they could be their very best and their most efficient. Okay, let's move on. I'm going to click me off and move back to the keynote. All right, so these are the questions you need to answer. You know, you need answers on. And the, the things that you need to do is you'll get some of this from the producers and from your production managers, but mainly you want to come in with a game plan. I don't really ask them anything till I have some kind of a semblance of a plan. And so I'm going to be asking, 
you know, with this plan, now that I have this whole plan and I put together this really thick Bible and it has all this stuff in it, it's got my scheduling, it's got uh, grip and lists, camera lists, uh, sun path printouts, it's all in this Bible that I give to my crew so I can say, okay, how many man days for pre-rigging, all these locations, how many C camera days I'm looking at on my schedule, how many days for the crane. So because you've gone through and shot listed the movie, you know exactly where you're going to use the crane, when you're not going to use the crane, how many condors and scissor lifts do you have? When you go into a stage environment, you need a lot of condors and scissor lifts to be able to get up on the walls and rig over the thing. So all this needs to, you see how having this plan and you got to do this plan quick. All right. This is a big aha moment because if you do not see those locations, whip together this plan, get it all dialed in you are not going to be able to have your team help you. You're going to be an island because you're going to hold off, not doing your work, not doing your homework, not figuring it out till the last minute. And then everyone else is going to create this shit show because now they're just getting the information and everyone is scrambling. So these are the questions that you got to answer. How many days on stage? How many days of specialty gear? More questions. How many extra man days do I have on my main lighting crew? Because you have a set budget for your uh, lighting and grip crew, but then there's days when you have condors and there's days when you uh, have uh, big cable runs that you got to bring in uh, other crew members. How many extra man days? How many extra man days do I have for my pre-rigging crew? So these are all things that you got to really uh, ask your team and the only way the team is going to be able to um i'm going to try to switch scenes okay the only way your team is going to be able to uh give you these numbers is if you have a solid plan moving forward and this is something that that is absolutely paramount all this has to be set up and then they will be able to get give you all these answers. How many trucks uh, are you going to have? How many generators do we need to carry? How many dollies do we have? Do we have the money for two dollies, a small dolly and a bigger dolly? Do we only have a budget for one? Um, okay. Okay. Communicating this vision is very important. And you have to communicate this vision and you need to build documents to do just that. I have so many documents that I build based on lighting and grip lists, camera specialty lists, all this stuff. You need to find uh, what works for you and, uh, and how you go about doing it. Now, the other thing is loyalty to your vendors. All right. Establish relationships so you can expand your vision outside of what is budgeted. This is a big thing. If it's so important for you to start these relationships with vendors because they are going to be your, you know, ace in the hole when you get that, mo that great movie where the story is unbelievable and you're working with this incredible director and you want to be able to take this you know, five or $10 million budget and make it look like a 50 million or 50,000 budget and make it look like a hundred thousand. So you do that by going and establishing these relationships and the loyalty of always going back to them no matter what. Okay. And even when I have commercial gigs and I hire my grip and gaffer, I'm always asking them, I know they have trucks I know they have all this and they need to provide for their, uh, for their families and everything. But I also have these relationships that I need to keep. So we're going to have to do this job at MBS uh, so I can uh, continue this relationship and the loyalty. It just doesn't stop at one movie. You have to continue this and make deals. You can barter and trade as well. 
okay? I've traded, you know, Movi Pros to, to loan to people to, I've, I've traded all these things that I have in my infrastructure to, to get me some more hours or stock footage or whatever it takes. So barter and trade, get, get, uh, get, you know, get in there and get your hands dirty. This is your moment and you got to seize it and ask for favors. It's, it's so important to, to ask for favors. You know, you got to ask for favors on all this stuff. So, uh, you know, and like I said, establishing these relationships, I've been with Evan Green when he was at Lee America at 1988. Then he moved and started Pascal in 1992. I moved over to Pascal. Then he went to MBS. And now I'm over at MBS. This is a relationship that started in 1988 and now it's 2020. I can always call on him. They support our amazing Hurlbut Academy and the blog. They supply gear so we can teach all of you. This is a long-standing relationship that you want to be able to hit. Okay. Be specific. Okay, do the work. Don't just get on a movie and be all in your whole creative space of the look and the camera tests and everything. That's only 30% of your job. Work with production. Try to figure out different ways to save money and save time. So do the work. Sometimes you got to work the weekends. Work the weekends. Give of your free time so you're prepared. I give so much free time because it takes less stress off of me on the day and I can be much more efficient. I can always come in with the attitude, how are you doing today, Shane? Freaking awesome. Okay. And don't be lazy. Do not be lazy. And I just, I, I, I hear so many horror stories from other producers I talk to on how other director photographies prep. Do not be that person. You want to be in the office every day. If the office is coming in on pre-production at 8 a.m., I'm there at 8 a.m. I'm there gracing the producers with whatever questions they have. Art department always has questions. You know, props are always coming up. Everyone is there. If you're not there, then they're not going to ask the questions and they're going to make their own movie. And this is what you have to understand. Being there is you continuing to communicate the vision. If you're not there, they're all going to make their own movies because there's nobody guiding and shaping them. And the director is being pulled in tons of places and it's you and the assistant director and the producer that really has to corral all this. You got to be present. Okay, figure it out. They want to see the is there the slides. To do with the hybrid? No. Figure it out. Lighting schematics, okay? Lighting schematics are absolutely essential. You don't want to, when I go into every situation, I have lighting schematics done on almost every location, every scene. It's all right there. So when I walk in, the, the gaffer knows exactly what we're going to be doing. And they, uh, the AD has the blocking schematics as well. I do not only the lighting schematics, but I see where, um, you know, we see where everyone is moving. So this whole blocking schematic is very important because that educates where the people are coming in and all that stuff. You got a shot list, okay? It's so important to shot list, all right? As much as I say storyboards, don't bother yourself with it. Uh, it. It's a lot of time and a ton of back and forth. Just go through the movie from scene one to scene 100 and just shot list the movie out. And then the scenes that are VFX based that need the storyboards for all that help so everyone can be on the right page, then go for that. But shot listing is something that, that I found, uh, you know, shot listing is, is the design of the film. The storyboards are, again, the icing on the cake. Uh, 
go back to your locations for inspiration, okay? Go there, uh, look at it. Uh, I've done this thing where, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, go back to the locations for inspiration, but that's a double-edged sword. Because what I've been doing recently is I take my Insta360 camera with my magic stick. I magic stick every location that we go on to, and then I don't ever have to go back. And the reason I do that is because it also saves money. Now you can say, okay, Shane, how much can that save? Okay, I'll break it down to you. If you go back to that location for inspiration, let's start to break it down. It's going to require a Teamster to take me to the location. It's going to require a location rep to be there at a location. We're going to then have to have my location manager also be at that location. So now we're starting to burn the location, right? If we keep on asking people to show up at this location because art department's got to go in there and take measurements and all that stuff. So you don't want to burn that location out either, okay? Now, the Teamster has to drive me in that van. There has to be snacks. There has to be water. There has to be all that stuff. You have to drive me to the location. I meet all these people. They open it up. Then we come back, okay? This is time consuming and it also is money. So if you can save that by doing this little Insta360 thing, you now have a virtual uh, blueprint of everything that you're doing and now you can just pull it up and you're like, oh yeah, there's a door there I forgot about. Oh yeah, I can bring the light in from there and then we can block them around. So you can do your blocking schematics and lighting schematics all based on this 360 environment. Okay. Do light studies, okay? Doing light studies is, is very important. You can just say, oh yeah, well, I got Sun Path, or I have Sun Scout, or I got Helios, or I got, I got all these. I know where the sun's going to be. Well, I've been burned by those programs uh, with magnetic deviation and all that kind of stuff. So the ones that are very important, I like to go there and light study that thing or at least have a location manager go there and do a light study for me while they're there with art department or something. So, so it's a, a dual process thing. And then you also want to track the sun and, and schedule your plan, right? So you want to, you want to do that. All right. Now let's get granular. Ask questions of your team so that you can prepare for them before they're on payroll. So this is what I was talking about, having this master plan before you even start to have conversations with them. And I'm sending them this Bible via PDF so they can go through it and see it all. And I have all the Insta360 videos so they can view all the locations. I'm doing all this stuff in pre-production so they have as much uh, so they can give me very close estimates of how many man days, how much manpower, all the lighting and crew. Get numbers on these man days. Get information on how long things are going to take. That's a big thing because if you don't have a plan and you don't have a lighting schematic and you don't have a blocking schematic and you don't have a shot list, it's really hard for you to do all this prep. But when you have a shot list, I'm lighting to that shot list. It makes me 10 times more efficient in lighting because I know where they're going. I know what they're doing. So these are big, big uh, money saving devices. Uh, and you can get information on how it's going to long it's going to take. So you can give the assistant director all the required information to them. So you're like, you know, I'm going to need a pre-call on this because we got to go in and set all this stuff up. And he's like, okay, cool. What do you think? Hour, two hour. And then we discuss that. So again, this is very communication, even when there's, when they're not on payroll. So you, the, your lighting and grip teams, they're usually working on another movie and uh, they only really have weekends to themselves and I want to be able to give them uh, their family time and, and respect that. But at the same time, they are working on this next gig and they got to get the gig. So it's, it's working with that. In prep, find other ways to simplify by talking to your keys, okay? 
Once you have this plan, you want to say, hey, this is what my best thought to do this is, but what do you think? And I've had gaffers and key grips say, what are you thinking? This is going to take us hours, Shane. What if we just do this? And it's like, aha moment. Okay, sure. That's going to be way less time. All right. Questions. Now we go to our questions. Okay, we have a lot of great questions. Okay. I'm seeing you. Uh, I think you're seeing me, yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, what do you think in general about previs for locations for what do you think? So uh, pre-visualization is there's a really great um, program that uh, oh boy I'm trying to remember what it is. Uh, it's a it's a previs program that uh, a lot of my director friends, uh, specifically with commercials, use. You can set your lens height. You can put people's age on their faces. You can inject pets and animals and all this stuff. It's a it's an awesome, uh, you know, previs program. And I find that it's really great for directors to be able to work it out in their head or you know on on how things will go together. I'm more in the top-down lighting schematic scenario and blocking schematic. I don't get really involved in moving cranes around and people and all that stuff. I'm just using simple icons uh, and and doing the, the schematics and blocking schematics. So the, the previs thing, I don't really spend a lot of time on uh, because I think... The shot listing and really figuring out a plan of how I'm going to light it and schedule it and all that stuff is a little more important. Um, people are saying Cine Tracer or Cinema 4D. Does that sound right? No, it was. Uh, it's the program's like eight hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, I would have to do okay, no some research on that. on that. Road. Maybe I can uh, <laughs> figure that answer. out. Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. What do you measure? Oh, Film Forge. Film Forge, F O R G E. Okay, uh, it's unbelievable. This pre visualization app, it's the best I've ever seen. Uh, it is expensive, it's pricey, but it's well worth uh, the money. Okay, so we have a great question about okay. what percentage of your shots are pre planned and storyboarded uh, versus finding it on the day. That's Part one. Okay, let's deal with that one. So I think people are hearing you now. So uh, basically what we're looking at is I try to shot list the whole movie. Uh, when I first started out, I would shot list what I thought and then I would say C blocking. Okay, this was my little get out of free jail card so I could be lazy. Yeah, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I, I'm not lazy. I figure it out. So I literally sit there and I was like, okay, I'm reading the scene and this is where the motivation, this is where the character should go. This is what it's saying in the script. And I just go off of that. Uh, now, are there times on the day where we see a serendipity moment or, oh boy, we better get an insert of that or something? Absolutely. That might not have been on the shot list, but 97% of the time, the shot list and the blocking schematic are absolutely gold, and we do that. Okay, what's the second part of that? Okay, I'm so sorry. I lost the question. I was writing something else. Um, so sorry. I will find it. And okay, just that. go to another question. Okay. Oh, and do you leave time to improvise and try new ideas on set? Yes, you're always trying to uh, give yourself uh, time to improvise. Uh, let me kind of uh, tell you one that I did on safety. So we had a scene where uh, the uh, where our brother and his little brother were doing this very uncomfortable dance. He, he was teaching him how to dance. So when he went to his little uh, grade school dance, he would be a better dancer. And his girlfriend was there as well. So we did this whole scene where the camera was this moving master that came in for close-ups and danced around him and everything. And at the end, it pulled away. 
and it just saw the two of them dancing together and the girlfriend just looking on and she had this amazing expression on her face and I was like, oh my God, we got to, this, this moment is magical. So I said, hey, Reggie, can I get just one more take? So I got on the radio with my gaffer and I'm like, okay, you see that uh, maxi brute that's outside there? When we pull back and we get to that moment, I want you to bring that maxi br br brute up full and it's gonna flare the lens and that's gonna get us out of the scene. And he's like, oh yeah, awesome. I said, hey, give me a couple minutes. So he programs it all in and he's got it and I'm like okay and let me see it and I get my camera in the right position it pulls back in this little you know lighting rehearsal real quick I didn't want to slow down the actors they were in the moment in the groove so this was all stuff while they were doing final touches and it's like oh he pulls back and the thing flares out it looks unbelievable so I'm like okay cool Reggie, are we ready? He goes, yeah, and action. We do the scene, he pulls back, we flare that lens out, and it was, un Reggie's like, he lost his mind. So yes, being efficient, doing the right pre-production planning, shot listing, blocking, lightning schematics, all this stuff that I talk about is gonna make you save time, which means you're saving money and you're less stressed on set, you're more efficient, and all of a sudden you can take advantage of these ama amazing ideas because that just came to me and, and I was able to immediately put it into action because we had a great plan moving forward. Okay, next, Lydia. All right. I have a very simple question from Peter who wants to know the going day rate for a condor. Okay, the going day rate for a condor. All right, so an 800 foot condor is usually, uh, 80 foot condor is usually around $650. A 60 foot condor is half that price usually, like 350, 325. So 60s are a lot cheaper. When you go up to 120s and 130s, the price goes up to $2,000, $2,500 on those things. And remember, you have drop-off fees and pickup fees. So those things add up as well. So there's a great uh, chart where you can go on. Uh, I think uh, there's Hertz Rentals has uh, all the pricing. They're, they're the main one in uh, Atlanta that we use. Uh, JLG is a, uh, Ahern is one of the best, uh, Condor, uh, websites on the planet. Uh, if you go to Ahern, they have all the JLG lifts in there and everything. It gives you all their specs. You can see their pricing, all their drop-off fees, all that stuff. And it really helps you. Now you got to understand if you put an 80 foot Condor and you want to do a, let's say a fly swatter. So a fly swatter is where you put a 20 by 20 or a 12 by 12 full grid or, or ultra bounce and you put that and you suspend it from your condor. Well, you got to understand that it's not just the condor, it's the pre-rig crew that comes in because it takes about two to four hours to rig that safely and correctly. So there's a pre-rig team that has to come in and rig, rig this truss underneath the basket and, and all the different arms and everything to be able to do this. So each thing, depending on what the condor is doing, it's exponential. So it's not just the price of the rental, it's also the price for the pre-rigging team to put the 18Ks and the Dinos and the fly swatters and all that stuff in it as well. Okay, what else we got, Lydia? Okay, moving on, uh, we have a director question. And Josh wants to know relationships with directors. Are they your friends, your boss? What's the great way to keep a relationship with them? Uh, I think the best way to cr keep an incredible relationship with your director is to show how passionate you are, how invested in this project you are, and they see that and it starts, it just starts a whole other layer to your relationship. Gabriel Muccino, once he worked with me and saw that I prepped the same way that he prepped, he was like, he had to do a movie with me last year without me. And I'll never forget, after he finished it, he just sent me this simple email that just said, Shane, I will never not work with you again. <laughs> 
So these are the kind of things that you want to do. And they're your friend and they're your boss, but you're really your co-collaborators together. And when you share that passion and understanding and you infuse this passion and it just, it just is infectious to all the departments that work alongside you. I okay. One more great question. Yep. Are there special shots you have in mind that you won't compromise? Um, Julian wants to know. Or in order to hold your originality. Absolutely. So, so Julian, there's these keyframes, as I call it. And we're going to get into a little bit of that uh, in a minute here. Uh, keyframes are in one shot. It's got to deliver all the emotional impact of that scene. So when I break down a script, I go through every scene and I come up with keyframes and I'll draw like a little thumbnail sketch of what that keyframe is. And that is in the shot list. Those are kind of, let's say, the heart of the scene. And everything revolves around getting to that keyframe. If you go to the Illumination Experience uh, workshop that we've gifted to the whole world, uh, you go to the blog, you go to the Illumination Experience Workshop, and in the second episode, which is how to prep, I go through the whole keyframe process, and it's unbelievable. It really teaches you how to start the core of your story and the big message of the story, then you break that down into keyframes. Okay, I'm going to switch over, and we are going to slide off of this screen and we are going to go to indie budgetering tips. Okay, Dolly saves time and money. Working on tripods is a waste of money. The tripods that I have are there basically to just set the camera down so I can light with. Very rarely do we use sticks, okay, uh, on tripods. I have these things I call my shit sticks that are very lightweight, they're carbon fired, they're, they come in, the, the camera department sits the thing down on there and I can start to light with it while everything else is going on. But a dolly, adjusting the height, pushing in, all these subtle movements are so much quicker than if you're doing it on a dolly, then you're dealing with sticks. Because every time you adjust the sticks, if you're not on a ball head, you gotta re-level, re-jigger that. Uh, and a lot of times you want to look at what that angle looks like a little higher or a little lower to, to uh, give them power or right at eye level. You want to be able to look at these things and what it does to the face and what you're emotionally telling to the actors. If you're trying to do this jacket up with sticks and everything, you're never going to get to that. You're never going to make your day and it's just not uh, wise. Use inexpensive gimbals to save time and money. Okay, so you want to be get, you want to be using gimbals to be in the place of laying tons of dolly track or dance floor or all that stuff. So gimbals save time and money. Balloon your main lighting and grip package so it will cover more drop loads and pre rigs, and you get a bigger discount. So the way it works in the rental house is drop loads is at a different percentage than your main lighting package. So as much as you can balloon that and still stay on budget, you can reap the benefits of stealing from that main lighting package to do a lot of your pre-rigging. So what I try to do, because usually they put that down at like a point two day week, and then maybe your, your drop loads on specific locations for a week or two weeks are 0.5 day week or a one day week. So if you balloon it, then it gives you more of that stuff to steal and grab and help you on your pre-rigs. More pre-production will save money. So the more prep you can do, and if they don't have the money for it and they can't pay you, you do the work. You donate that time. You give of your time so you can make, you can seize them open to make this great. Find locations that light themselves. If you have a really tight budget, you got to work with a lot of locations that have consistent light coming through windows for a good amount of time. You got to find those locations that they light themselves. Okay, go into the next screen. 
Uh, hold on one second. Here we go. Okay. Use lights that are not expensive. Go old school. Think about it. A Fresnel light can do a lot more things than a sky panel can, right? So uh, a Fresnel light can be a hard shadow. You can diffuse it. You can bounce it. You can, you know, change the color temp with gel. You can do all these things that you necessarily cannot do with a sky panel or some kind of LED fixture. And if you look at it, an 18K rents for 550 a day. Well, if you do the 0.2 day week, it ends up being like $50 a day. But that sky panel S60 sometimes is $15.50 a day, or I've seen prices at $2,500 a day for a sky panel, okay? That is not going to be any way as versatile as an 18K. So it's picking those lights that you can be and and uh, it, which is going to be better for your budget. Kino flows are dime on the dollar compared to light mats and asteras and all this stuff that's really hot now. So it's got a higher price tag budgeting wise. So these are things that you want to steer away from. Okay. Let's see. Now let's go to the next uh, slide. Okay. Uh, so sorry, I'm trying to do my best switching, uh, possible. Okay. Jimmy jib and a triangle jibs are a huge saver on budget. I never use anything in between. It's either a techno crane or a Jimmy jib. I don't use other cranes. You can turn your minivan into a camera car. Okay. So I shoot out of minivans all the time. You can shoot out of the side door. You can, and, and you can, you know, ratchet strap it so it doesn't come uh, doesn't close. You can do the same thing on the back and shoot out the rear. There's a lot of things you can do. You can do poor man's process car work. Get really inventive. You can use SUVs with black arms and Ronin 2 or Movi XLs for your Russian arm. Okay, now I talked about blocking and I talked about uh, shot listing. We have inside the Hurlbut Academy, a brand new course called Blocking and Composition and Adventures. And this course has blocking and keyframes. So you start to understand the keyframe process, building your shot list, how to put your whole shot list together, blocking and composition, the compositions that you're using to emotionally tell the story. So all this we're putting out there for you so you can take advantage of. Now, when I say boosted board time, right? There's gonna be times when you need to literally uh, do tracking shots with a, a boosted board. So that's ways to save money as well. You can do that. You can go from old school, which was if you needed a high angle, uh, you can, it used to mean being a ladder pod and two grips and uh, pre-rigs and all that stuff to be able to get it. And then if you want to move it, because that's not the greatest location, then you, uh, you, it takes time to move it. With the new school approach, I just take a high, high roller. I send that son of a bitch 25 feet in the air and I got my Movi on the end of it and I'm able to look out, get it to the perfect position. Oh, let's move it 10 feet over to the left. Crank it down, move it real quick, stem it back up. We're all locked and loaded. So these are labor saving and budget saving tips for y'all. Become a crane, okay? You can become a crane. By using a gimbal, you're able to use a crane. You become a crane. You put a little rostrum. We put a three-foot riser, and all of a sudden, you can go from four inches off the ground to 16 feet off the ground just with the use of a gimbal. Okay, poor man's camera car. You can see this. We're using the minivan to literally go and uh, be on this, uh, to follow these people down the road. We were able to use it as a beautiful poor man's camera car, the minivan. Turn your SUV into a Russian arm car. You can do it with the small tips from the black arm. They're very easy to rent. And now all of a sudden you have a Russian arm car and you use the Flow Cine black arm. Now we have a lot of these tips inside 
uh, our poor man's process urban night where uh, they're beautifully crafted lessons that show you how to recreate streets at, at night, urban streets, engineer realistic lighting effects to show motion, uh, your DP colorist relationship in the bay, uh, all these different uh, ways to do that. Now here's a labor saving one. Okay. Everyone talks about poor man's process. Oh my God, it's not poor man's process, Shane. This is so expensive. Well, it's not. You put a car outside at night. I take some black uh, uh, butcher paper. I cut some holes in it. I put some gels on them. I put that in the background. I put some Kino flows that I can move by hand. I get some car headlights that go across their face. And now all of a sudden I'm creating images like this, where you're absolutely seeing all that beautiful bokeh. It looks like the person is driving in the car. You're moving the car and it looks like it's perfect. This one I did on a sound stage, all that bokeh out of focus. And I had a motorcyclist come up and try to grab the handle of the car to open it. And then he, op he veers and the motorcyclist goes down. So all these things are easily done. And we're here for questions. Okay. Uh, I just want to do a safety shout out on this poor man's car process that you were fully rigged and safety matters. So please talk about a little bit of safety. Oh yeah. So, so that people don't hang themselves out of a car. Yes, of course. So it, with this poor man's process stuff, if you look at those pictures again, you can see that they're all rigged with harnesses and everything. Everything is safety. The camera's safety, the operator's safety, everything is, is all done so everyone's secure. And these things, you obviously don't want to get so radical uh, with doing any of these kind of things unless you have a whole stunt team that's, that's driving the car, that's doing all these stuff that, that keeps it as safe as possible. Great. All right, what questions do we have? Um, well, we are almost out of time. So I think we'll do... Um, Give me one, one, one or two questions and then we'll move on to the Hurlbut Academy. Okay. Uh, David Weldon wants to go you to go into drop loads because not everybody understands uh that's a great question okay this is funny so i was working on holiday and when i worked with the producer and everything i i was shot listing the movie and putting it all together with the director and when i uh got there uh i had already seen you know i saw all the locations I put my main lighting list together and I was already doing drop loads. So let me clarify what a drop load is. A drop load is a package of lights that is specific to the location. So your main lighting package is going to be able to handle day exteriors, most day exteriors, most day interior environments. But there's some environments that on holiday we went into a massive nightclub. And I have all these moving lights and projectors and all these Lecos and Astera tubes and all this stuff uh, that's not necessarily on my main lighting package. So that gets drop loaded to the location. It has its own price structure that's usually not the discounted uh, list. The pre-rigging team goes in with that drop load, or if you don't have a pre-rigging team, you have a pre-call. So you show up two hours or so before, take all that stuff, hang it, do whatever you got to do to rig it. So it's ready for us when we work in, so we can start finessing and, and doing all the lights. So these drop loads and on holiday, the producer came up to me and said, I am so pumped that you actually understand how to do a drop load list. And it gets down to the whole thing of understanding and doing the work. Do not be lazy. Figure it out. Do the lighting schematics. Do the blocking schematics. Do everything so you can light it in a vacuum and know exactly what everything is. Put the list together necessary so you can then put all the drop loads together so we can get an accurate budget together. Because so many times 
this budget crunch happens right before we go to production and everyone's scrambling and everyone hates this process. It's like two weeks before all these lists got to be put together. All these man days got to be put together. All these drop loads have to be put together. Do this prior as much as you can to then make it uh, affordable and efficient. All right. Please like our YouTube channel and Follow us. Oh, yes. And like our YouTube channel and follow us. We want more. We want to expand the net. We're out there. We're slinging it. We're sharing the knowledge. We uh, join us. Join us. I, I have the passion. I have the inspiration. And, and I love talking with all of you and sharing 30 plus years of experience. And with that, let's go to, let's slide right over and let's get nitty gritty with all this. Here is my wife, Lydia, who through everything, she had this vision to inspire and share the knowledge at a global scale. So in 2009, we launched the Hurl blog. And it was this small little blog that we were sharing knowledge because I was doing commercials and active valor all on a Canon 5D still camera. And we, everyone wanted, and it was, it was awesome because as much as I shared, I got back as well. And it started the conversation. Well, all the followers were not happy with that conversation. They wanted more. So in 2014, we created Shane's Inner Circle. And in the Inner Circle, it was a place for filmmakers to learn. And I went down a little deeper into that rabbit hole and started to do some videos and started to share my knowledge in a more in-depth approach. And then everyone continued to want more. They were like, my God, I got a piece of that. I want more. So then we launched the Hurlbut Academy in uh, 2019. And this is a powerhouse of a resource. Okay, this resource has over 4,000 or over 400 lessons. It's got over 30 plus courses. Uh, let me go to the, um, and you go with, uh, so you go here and you have, you can browse whole courses, you can browse individual lessons. You can go onto the left rail and you can narrow your results. And it's built like a director cinematographer. So I want to learn how to light day interiors. Well, you can go over there. You can click on that. You can click on lighting. You can see day. You can see on interior. You can see on location or on set. It's all based on the mindset of a cinematographer or a director or any type of filmmaker. Uh, now, you can see that we've given the Illumination Experience Workshop, which was usually $500. We've shared it with everyone. You can go on the blog and you can get this. It's eight hours of instruction and it takes you through the whole process of uh, understanding how to light a face, how to understand how to prep, keyframes, blocking, how to rehearse block light and shoot, uh, it's really cool. All different lighting environments. Now, we've continued to give free information out there. We created the Hurlbut Academy free sampler. You can go in the store, click right on there, and buy it for $0. It has 31 free lessons. And look at it. Pre-production, it's got 10 just in pre-production alone. It has 15 just in lighting techniques and it has another 10 in camera techniques. So these are all things that you want to be able to uh, get your hands on. It's all within the academy and the store. And you can go there and it's all right there so you can sample what we have. And one more thing. Yes. David, interview tomorrow. With I will. I will. Okay. We also dive deep into cinematography right? So we're diving deep into cinematography. So we do the look of series. We did the look of 1917. We did the look of Parasite. We did the look of uh, the Joker. So get on the blog and look at what we've done. And there's all these in-depth videos on and behind the scenes on all this. 
We go into infrared cinematography. We have all these courses where there's some of our most popular courses, blocking and lighting A to Z. That is one of my favorite courses that we put together. Lighting for horror, uh, lighting night exteriors, lighting day interiors, how to be a focus puller, poor man's process, commercial directing, uh, night interiors, poor man's process, green screen versus blue screen. Uh, we got new courses that we just brought up. We have blocking and composition that goes into the whole keyframe scenario. We also have our uh, day interiors volume two and we're releasing volume three uh, in the coming weeks. And we have poor man's uh, process urban night. We also guide you. So if you come to the site and you don't know where to start, there's these things called pathways. You click on the pathway icon at the top of the browser. And if you want to be a cinematographer, this has every lesson that you click on and it's hyperlinked right into the academy that shows you everything that you need to know. And it spells it all out. You can learn the basics then you can take that further and then you can take, you can go pro. All right. So we have a couple announcements tomorrow. We have an amazing David Weldon series. Oh, sorry. So, tomorrow at noon, David Weldon series has Polly, what's her last? Polly Morgan. Polly Morgan. A Quiet Place 2. Uh, she shot A Quiet Place 2, and she's done a ton of other amazing uh, television series as well as feature films. Uh, she's a very talented female cinematographer. She's an ASC member, and it's going to be awesome uh, going through her whole process and techniques. David has really uh, put together uh, an amazing series, and he's much better at switching these scenes than I am, for sure. <laughs> and where is it, Shane? And it's going to be on the Hurlbut Academy Facebook page. So you go to the Hurlbut Academy Facebook page at 12, and you're able to ask questions and David has got it all lined up where he actually shows the questions and does all this interactive stuff. And then at the end of it, we'll be offering a course that's gonna be discounted in the store so you can take advantage of that as well. All right, any other things that I need to announce? Okay, well, I wanna give you, first off, I wanna thank my whole team that has put this all together. Lydia, Anne, Chris, Ben, Ross, I cannot, Shelly, I cannot do it without all of you. You are an amazing uh, group of filmmakers and passionate workers that make me look like I actually know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's been such a pleasure uh, working with all of you. And thank you all for coming and being a part of this. Now, We've been doing some really cool things during uh, the COVID-19 lockdown. And I want to share with you a new teaser trailer for the Hurlbut Academy. So hold on to your short shorts and here we go. And I said, I'm not there where you're at. I'm lower budget. How do I scale your knowledge to that type of production? What he said was really huge. He said, you know what, man? Like, don't do that. This is where I am. This is where I aspire to be. Shoot for that. Because then the sky's the limit.
can get you all fired up. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Love you all. Bye-bye. Stay safe, be healthy, and continue to take all the safety protocols so we can end this and get back to work. Bye-bye, all.